Hello, fellow biochemists. Um, this is our next part of videos on our lectures on BIS 103. This will be lecture five, and I divided it up into four videos. What we want to cover in these videos is there are two on sort of our continued discussion on carbohydrate metabolism. Specifically, we'll be looking at polysaccharides today. And we want to continue discussion on what's actually happening to the pyruvate that we discussed earlier as our product of glycolysis, but haven't really looked at what we are going to do with it outside of fermentation. And we'll have to discuss a few more cofactors. So both these topics will be covered under separate videos for this lecture five. For this video here, what I want to talk about is sort of a continued discussion on how we can break down different sugars for energy metabolism. So our learning goal just for this video will be that at the end of it, we want to be able to explain some of the common and distinct pathway reactions that we can use for the utilization, but also for the storage of polysaccharides. So let's look at this again. We had mostly focused on glucose so far. We had also talked in the last lecture a bit more about some of our disaccharides. What we want to focus on now are our polysaccharides. So polymers of carbohydrates. The two major polymers that we're going to deal with is our starch and our glycogen. Both are actually polymers of glucose molecules. The difference is that starch is actually the polymer that you will find in plants and glycogen is the glucose polymer that you will find in mammals or animals. Why is it important to use polymers for storing sugars, the major importance actually has to do with osmolarity. Right? Compared to having the same amount of sugar as monosaccharides, as compared to polymers, is actually that polymers have a much lower osmolarity, they're less, much less reactive, making them a very good storage compound. And just to sort of give you one example here is 0.4 molar of free glucose actually equals only 0.01 micromolar of glycogen. So you see the scale here by which we can actually store glucose, for example, in form of, a gl of glycogen as a polymer so much better, much higher amounts that can be stored in your body if you use a polymer to do so. Okay. One important aspect is that breaking down these polymers, they're actually two very critical different ways in how we deal with external polymers. So those that we get through our diet and those internal ones that you actually have as storage glycogen in your own bodies. Okay. So what are these two differences? For the dietary ones, and it's regardless of whether it's starch or glycogen here, the dietary ones, so those that are you getting through your food are catabolized to free glucose. Right? By contrast, the internal ones, so again, mostly glycogen, right? We're talking now about glycogen in um, animals. These glycogen storages are largely in the liver and also to some degree in the muscle. There are some other tissues, but these are the two major ones we'll be discussing. Here, we are not catabolizing them to free glucose. What we're actually doing is that we're catabolizing them down to glucose 1-phosphate and that then is converted into glucose 6-phosphate inside the cell as our glycolytic intermediate. What do these molecules look like? So here's just an example of one chain of starch or glycogen here that's called amulose. So it's glucose monomers condensed with each other through one four glycosidic bonds. Right? So we have these linear branches here. And then in addition, we have additional branches. So each of these branches up here can be combined with another branch through now not a one four glycosidic bond, but a one six glycosidic bond. And so you can pack these individual branches very tightly. And that's sort of, of indicated here, right? You have these linear strands of glucose molecules, and then these can be branched to other linear molecules, right? In the end, what you actually achieve is a package form, much like here in the helix, looks a lot like DNA, right? So these helical structures are actually very compact and they're ideal three-dimensional forms of packaging 
a lot of material in a small space. So we're actually using the same principles as we use for DNA here for our glycogen, as well as starch. What's the difference then between glycogen and starch? It's actually quite minimal. Again, both are polymers of glucose. The difference is in the ratio of amulose, which are these linear branches of alpha 1,4 link glucoses, to amylopectin, which are alpha 1,6 branched. So there's a different ratio between starch and glycogen. And another difference is that the branching points are different. In starch, we have a branching point just about every 24 residues. And in glycogen, it's actually much more frequent. We have it at about every 8 to 12 residue. So these are the two major differences. But for the most part, you can assume just as a tightly packed polymer of glucose for both starch and glycogen. This is what it actually looks like in a cell. So here you have sort of this bundle of glycogen. You see all the linear branches and then branched to another one here. Actually, what we see is that these glycogen bundles are bound around a protein that sort of functions as an anchor point, and we call that glycogenin. Right? If you actually look under the microscope, it's really interesting that you see here in the cytosol where glyconesis is happening, and then you have the mitochondria here. This is where the ETC or the electron transfer chain is happening. We haven't touched on it yet, but it's a pathway that eventually allows us to use the energy released in NADH from glycolysis for ATP production. And so between glycolysis and the ETC of the mitochondria, you actually here in black see these high density glycogen granules. So in your cell, Everything is actually sort of in one place, tightly packed together so that you can efficiently use glycogen breakdown for glycolysis and then the ATC to make energy. So everything sort of in one drawer together. What does it look like now in um, a human tissue, for example? As I said, the major storage points for glycogen is the liver. This is actually the major storage organ. There's also some glycogen in the muscle. The major difference between the two is that in muscle, glycogen is not broken down to free glucose that then is released. The muscle doesn't do that. Instead, glycogen is broken down through glycolysis and the ATC later to generate energy for movement. So you could see the muscle here as a really selfish organ. It's not releasing any of its glycogen in form of free glucose. The more social organ now is our liver here. Our large glycogen storage in the liver actually is being broken down in the same way with the major difference now that we're not using it for energy production. There is some going on for the internal energy metabolism of the liver, but a lot of it as need arises will be released at free glucose from the liver into the bloodstream. Okay, so these are two differences between the utilization of glycogen in muscle and liver, respectively. And this really makes sense if you actually think sort of about your day, right? Glycogen is really important here. What I show you here actually is the concentration of blood sugar across your day and sort of see, right, sort of you come home after a big exam, you go to bed and sleep, you have dinner, things happening. So you have lots of different things happening throughout your day, but your blood glucose pretty much stays constant. Okay. If you compare this through your glycogen storage, thinking about the exact same activities, now here your glycogen storage massively changes throughout the day and largely correlating with when you have some food intake, but it's really massively changing. And so this is your liver's job, right? It's using its glycogen stores, depending on your current situation, to always make sure that your blood glucose levels stay almost the same, okay? Now switching over to plants, slightly different. They're not using glycogen, they're using starch, right? Some of the major sources for starch in your diet is, for example, any kind of tuber. Potatoes are a prime example but a lot of your grains, wheat, rice, corn, and so forth, 
that store starch in their seeds as a major food for when they grow. Right? So before a plant reaches the light as a seed in the soil, it needs to do metabolism. It cannot yet do photosynthesis to produce energy. So plants use starch stored in the seeds for their early metabolism in early development. And we can use it as our food, as a resource for carbohydrates in our diet. So now back to the breakdown. I already had mentioned there are some major differences in how we break down extracellular, so dietary versus intercellular carbohydrate polymers and how we can do this. The major difference, again, extracellular, regardless of whether it's glycogen or starch, will be broken down to free glucose. Intracellular will be broken down to glucose 1-phosphate that then is isomerized to glucose 6-phosphate that can enter glycolysis. Right. How do we do this? So now imagine, right, you just had some nice French fries, lots of starch. How do we break it down? This actually happens already in your mouth. In your saliva, you have an enzyme called alpha amylase. It's a hydrolase. A hydrolase is using water to break these 1,4 alpha glycosidic bonds from each other. The result is that you're freeing up glucose, free glucose, right, through hydrolysis. A little bit better highlighted here. So here you can imagine this is just now a disaccharide part of one of these branches of starch, for example, right, you have this alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond here. And now the enzyme is coming in, it's a hydrolase. It's a maltase in this case, because you're only dealing with two glucose monomers. If you're looking at these entire glycogen branches, that's the alpha amylase, the mechanism is the same. You're bringing in water and you're breaking this alpha glycosidic bond. Right? The one hydrogen of the water goes to this alcohol here and the other one that now has lost the oxygen function gets the remainder of the water, the hydroxy group here. You're releasing two free glucose molecules. Okay. Simple hydrolysis at this stage. Now this becomes very different now for our intracellular glycogen storage, as well as also for starch, but we mostly want to focus on glycogen for our purposes. And I also want to focus on liver and muscle because there are some very important differences because of the different uses of glycogen, okay? What is happening now is that we are not using hydrolysis, we're actually using phosphorolysis. That's a mouthful, but basically what it means is we're not using water to break the glycosidic bond here. We're using phosphate to do the same. And we're doing so always at the non-reducing end. So basically the end of your glycogen, one of those branches, the end will be the non-reducing end. Okay. The enzyme is called a glycogen phosphorylase. And so you're bringing in phosphate. And so now instead of using the water molecule, part of the phosphate now will leave the remainder of the branch here with the hydrogen as well as the oxygen here. So you get a reducing end at this end here. And the other one is taking up the phosphate at the anomeric carbon. So what you end up with is glucose 1-phosphate. Okay. So we're not releasing free glucose. We are releasing glucose 1-phosphate when we use phosphorylase. Right? This actually really is, is a good way of doing it. And it makes sense because what we're bypassing here now, right? What we can do is simple isomerization to glucose 6-phosphate, down glycolysis. What we have bypassed is the first ATP requiring kinase reaction. So in doing this reaction, we can bypass the first phosphorylation. So we are saving for each time we do this one ATP. So a net yield of glycolysis coming from internal glycogen storage per molecule is one ATP more. And so you can, in a way, imagine this sort of as a, as a Pac-Man system that the phosphorylase comes in and sort of chops off and chews off one of these molecules after the other, right? Walking along this strand and getting one after the other released as glucose one phosphate. One problem with this is that we have these branches, right? 
And so one thing that glycogen phosphorylase cannot do is deal with these branch points. So this is highlighted here, right? The phosphorylase can start attacking at all these non-reducing ends. So it will chop off glucose 1-phosphate molecules one after the other, moving along this branch here. But the moment that it comes to the point of four residues left, it has to stop. It just can't access it anymore. It can't work. So how do we overcome this? This is actually a bifunctional enzyme that we're now using. It's called the debranching enzyme. It does exactly what the name indicates it does. It takes care of the branch. It has two functions. The first function is a transferase activity. What it does is it takes three of the last four residues of this branch here, cleaves them off, and actually puts them at the end, right? making a linear polymer again. And then the second activity comes in, that's a glucosidase activity. So this will actually will now use hydrolysis to just cleave off this last glucose molecule here that is in the way and it's released as free glucose. Okay. Once that is done, the glycogen phosphorylase activity can come back in and start chewing one by one on this grant. So all this debranching enzyme does is, is to take the branch and put it back at the end so that the phosphorylase can do its job. Here's just as an overview of what these enzymes do. Um, I really only expect you for the purpose of our exams to understand this general mechanism as I have explained it and to know these general names here. Okay. So we had talked about the glycogen phosphorylase that uses phosphate to break the glycosidic bond. We talked about these two activities of the debranching enzyme, the transferase and the glucosidase activity. One that I haven't mentioned only briefly yet is this phosphoglucomutase. Remember, a mutase is an isomerase, and so this is the enzyme that is relevant then to convert the glucose 1-phosphate molecules that we're releasing in this process back into glucose 6-phosphate. So this is how we can deal with breaking down glycogen into monosaccharide units, again, that can go into glycolysis for further energy breakdown. So this concludes this part. Now that we have talked about all these different sugars, what I usually like to do in BIS 103 is to start drawing our own map, which really, I think, helps to put things into perspective. And so I will do just a separate breakout video so you can put them all into context later that will show sort of the map of BIS 103 as far as we stand now.